Welcome everybody um, to MOHI tonight. Um, we're here for a special program. I'm Mary Ellie. I'm the Director of Annual Giving and Membership here, and we're just so happy that you've joined us. Um, I'm a brown woman with dark brown hair sitting in front of a photo of MOHI. Uh, the program will last a little over an hour, and on the bottom of your screen you'll see a toolbar. This is where you can access the chat box and Q&A box. Enter your questions at any time throughout the program and we'll respond to all questions at the end of the program. Email program at MOHI um, if you're calling in for questions or use chat for other comments. Closed captioning can be turned on and off from the toolbar at the bottom of the screen. During the program, all attendees are muted, but you can share your comments in the chat box. Be sure to select all attendees and panelists so that everyone can see your message. Myself and our team member colleague, Kelsey Novick, will be here behind the scenes to respond to your chat and email questions. I just want to take a minute to extend my gratitude for, uh, to everyone in attendance um, for your ongoing support of MOHI through your membership and um, gifts throughout the past year. It's meant so much to us and it's helped us sustain the museum for a challenging time for everyone. And now um, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Artist Talk with Preston Singletary and MOHI Executive Director, Leonard Garfield. Thank you, Mary Ellie. And I just wanna echo what you said, which is to welcome all of our members and to thank them for their support. And especially to thank Preston for joining us tonight. I'll, I'll be introducing Preston in just a second, but I do want to uh, do as we always do when we start a MOHI program is to acknowledge that we are on the land of indigenous people, of the Duwamish, the Suquamish, Coast Salish people. We honor their endurance, we recognize their presence uh, and their importance to our community today. So we wanna make that acknowledgement as we get started. I am very, very lucky that I get to introduce our special guest today. Preston Singletary has become uh, associated in the art world with the relationship between European glass blowing traditions and Northwest native art. His artwork features themes of transformation, animal spirits, shamanism, all manifested through elegant blown glass forms and mystical sand carved plinket designs. We're gonna learn more about your background, Preston, but I know you learned the art of glass blowing by working with some renowned artists here in the Seattle area, including such luminaries as Benjamin Moore and Dante Marioni. Uh, you also were, uh, a, a student and a practitioner in Europe, and you had the opportunity to work with some of the great Venetian glass artists in Italy when you spent time there. And also for decades, you've worked with indigenous artists, and we'll be talking about that as we go through the program tonight. Preston is internationally recognized. His work is included in museum collections, including the British Museum, the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, the Seattle Art Museum, of course, the Corning Museum of Glass, the Mint Museum of Art and Design in Charlotte, Heard Museum in Phoenix and the Smithsonian in Washington, DC. It's an amazing array of the best art institutions in the, in the world. Preston maintains an active schedule. He teaches, he lectures, he exhibits all over the place. Um, some of the uh, major exhibits that I've been privileged to see include the uh, Museum of Glass Show in Tacoma, uh, entitled Preston Singletary Echoes, Fire and Shadows. And in 2018, he launched a new traveling exhibit in collaboration with the Museum of Glass titled Raven and the Box of Daylight, which really pushes the boundary of glass as a medium for storytelling. And I wanna talk about that. And before I ask the first question, Preston, and welcome you officially, I also know that you are a musician and like a rock musician kind of. So you're an art star, you're a rock star. Thank you, Preston, for joining us tonight. Hey, we're a history museum. Um, so I gotta start with this first question, which isn't on my script, and I didn't tell you I was gonna ask you this. But what is the formative story of Preston Singletary? Where, where'd you, where were you born? Uh, where'd you grow up? Um, and, and how did you get in those very early years? How did you become an artist? Well, I, um, I was technically, I was born in San Francisco, but my parents are from Seattle. They moved down there. I was born. Before I was a month old, we were to return to Seattle. So I'm basically a Seattleite. <laughs> um, been here my whole life. Um, I had, you know, two occasions where my mailing address would, would have been outside of Seattle three months in, in uh, Juneau, Alaska, when I was uh, 17, turning 18, and then 
six months in Stockholm, Sweden, where I met my wife. Um, and that was in 1993. Other than that, I've always lived here. I've always um, uh, never found a great reason to leave. Everything that I was involved with was happening here between music and uh, the glass art that I kind of, I kind of rather fell into um, at age 19. I started working at the Glass Eye Studios, which is a studio that's still in existence. It's changed owners a couple of times, but uh, um, it was a production factory. I spent about three years there working on the fundamentals and making production wear. And then I uh, shifted over to the studio of Benjamin Moore, who um, I have to mention, uh, unfortunately, we lost Benjamin uh, about a little over a week ago. Um, and uh, and that's been quite quite a shocking uh, thing for the entire glass uh, community. But anyways, I spent 20 years working with Benjamin in his studio uh, as an assistant. But at the, uh, on the side, I uh, would develop my own work on, in various ways. Um, uh, usually on the weekends, the assistant, we would get um, an opportunity to, to blow glass for ourselves. Um, I attended the Pilchuck Glass School in 1984. Um, I, um, and I'd been up there intermittently, you know, for the past, uh, you know, well, since 1984 till I just was up there about three weeks ago doing a residency. Um, and um, so that's really where um, I learned how artists work with glass, essentially. Mm -hmm. I, I was able to um, be exposed to this international community of glass artists that um, you know, came from all over the world. And you know, we had the good benefit of being exposed to them and learning different sensibilities um, uh, of how to work with glass. Um, and I experimented while I was up there. And I basically started dabbling in the, um, the form line design, uh, which was what, you know, the, the type of design work that you kind of see behind me, uh, we, we call that form line. And, and that's um, kind of anthropological term, but that's what the, uh, the style that the name has been given. Um, and uh, so it's all based on clinket uh, uh, design. And that's my, my family background. Um, you know, it's a matrilineal society. I come from the uh, eagle moiety. I come from the killer whale clan. Uh, the brown bear and the wolf are also um, symbols that represent my family. Um, and so, you know, there, it's a long story to tell. But it yeah. essentially, I in in um, after I got married in 1995, I really decided. I better start, you know, working on something a little more, you know, I, I was trying to maintain a music uh, career simultaneously while working with all these incredible glass artists. But um, um, I started to focus on the, uh, the native design work um, very seriously in about 1997, 98. And then I started to have shows um, with the work um, and, people instantly kind of re recognized that this was something a little more personal, a little deeper. And so I started to um, make connections with uh, collectors and selling my work and just grew from there. It's an amazing story. Um, and you, you talk about your family and your, your traditional connections, but I think Preston, I read somewhere that it was your grandparents in particular that inspired you in an appreciation and an, and an understanding of indigenous culture and your own personal heritage. What, what was your relationship with your grandparents and what did you learn from them? Well, it was, it was actually my great grandmother who uh, moved down from Sitka, Alaska to Seattle in 1923. So from that point forward, uh, the entire family grew up in this region. Um, and my grandmother, or my great grandmother, was uh, it was a prearranged marriage, which was tradition at the time, at the turn of the century. Uh, she was widowed in 1919, and then she met a Filipino man named uh, Dionisio Gubatayo, and she re she married him and brought the entire family to Seattle. My grandmother Lillian uh, Gubatayo 
uh, or, uh, she married a Filipino man as well. Mm -hmm. So my, my mother is actually half Filipino, half Tlingit. So technically we're Tlingitpinos. Uh, uh, and uh, so, um, and my father is, you know, mixed European, Scotch, Irish, English, German, Norwegian, French. So he's you know, quite, quite mixed up. And um, my, and so I grew up with, um, you know, it was my great uncle who was the half Filipino man and half Plinket, that um, uh, child of my great grandmother who recorded a lot of these stories, uh, wrote them down, uh, transcribed them. And so um, those were, inspirational to me and of course you know our, our family was was um you know connected to the tribal community um, and you know did, did a lot of functions you know, within the filipino community as well as the native community um and so that was something you know but you know i grew up fairly urban you know wanted to be a you know a rock musician uh and uh and so i didn't really pay a whole lot of attention um, to it. I mean, it was part of my background, but then um, over time, it really started to speak more loudly to me. And so I, I endeavored to uh, start to develop the work that I do today. Yeah. You, your initial work, uh, you know, Preston, you were a student in Pilchuck initially, as well as, of course, becoming an instructor and a guest lecturer and so forth. In, in those early experiences at Pilchuck, were, you were trained and learning in the great European tradition of, of glass art. Is that correct? And, and how, yeah. how, how, how did that feel to a young guy from other traditions who is also a rock musician? <laughs> well, you know, I, so I, when I came into glass blowing, there, it just, there wasn't a lot of, there wasn't a big community in Seattle, although it started to grow, you know, really, just prior to that time, 1982, uh, and it, today it's quite robust, you know, the whole community. Um, I, you know, because I didn't go to college, I didn't go to uh, uh, higher education beyond high school, I, I ended up falling into glass blowing through the introduction of Dante Marioni, who's a good friend of mine. Um, we started to work together very intensively and, you know, at the time it was, it gave me an, the ability to work with my hands, which um, I, I wouldn't say I was especially uh, gifted at it in the beginning, but I stuck with it. And then I had these opportunities to work with really exceptional people. Um, and I learned a lot about technique and aesthetic and process and style and all of this. And, and so, um, so, you know, the work, the early work I did was more reflective of the kinds of people that I was working with. Like Benjamin Moore was, you know, very, very, uh, had a very high aesthetic in terms of his um, style and his uh, sense of design, which was far different than, you know, you know, the, the, the hippie, the hippie movement, you know, making, you know, really funky uh, things and being really loose with it. And then, you know, Benjamin brought uh, the Italians, you know, the Europeans over. He was the artistic director of Pilchuk for 20 years. So he uh, made a motion to, out to, to the, the Europeans and brought them over and exposed us all to um, uh, very, I don't know, special and almost secret techniques that we were able to adopt and sort of change and re- synthesize for our um, own purposes, our own aesthetic and style. And eventually I got much more into sculpture, you know, where I'm more manipulating the glass um, out of the round, you know, less um, vessel oriented and more right. sculptural. So, um, so that's, that's, you know, kind of how um, I felt about it. It was really I felt very privileged to be working with these, you know, amazing people, but they're, they're all my friends, you know, yeah. Rick Royal and, you know, Dante and uh, Benjamin, you know, we in turn worked for Dale Chihuly and, you know, because Benjamin was very close with Benjamin or with, with Chihuly. Um, so I had that exposure too. wasn't, uh, you know, it was never, it was never full time. But, you know, it, it got in there somehow, uh, you know, the influences. Yeah. 
And and I think, Chris, am I right that Kolchak turns 50 this year? That's correct. Yeah, 50 years of uh, in existence. Yep. So it's an it's an amazing history and an amazing gift to the Northwest. You've brought a, a couple of slides for us to look at this evening. Mm -hmm. And I thought maybe as we go through the conversation, show us a couple of pieces of work and we'll talk about those. And you know, maybe I'll ask you some unrelated questions. But yep. Well, this ahead, one, this is a uh, uh, you know public art uh, piece that was made. Uh, for uh, uh, an apartment down in, in um, Portland. Um, it's 20 feet tall, uh, water jet cut steel and glass, and it's illuminated from inside. So at night, it has a really beautiful glow to it. Wow. How many people are on your team to physically create that work, in including the you know, engineering and electrical people right. and all the rest of it? So, you know, most of these, the public arts are very new direction for me uh, at the moment. And I work uh, collaboratively with a guy named David Franklin and we, we work together developing these ideas and he kind of does a lot of the footwork. Um, you know, in, in my studio, um, so generally with this kind of thing, we work with contractors who uh, execute, uh, you know, the details, uh, you know, in their fabrication studio. In my own studio, my particular, uh, you know, my studio that I call my studio, there, I have four employees. So uh, working on various aspects of the, um, the steps that I take uh, to, to make each piece. So this one is, you know, a, you know, a collaborative effort with uh, David. We uh, work with contractors and hire structural engineers and figure out how to make all this come together. So it's, it's kind of a new direction, learning yeah. a lot along the way. What neighborhood in Portland is that located in? This is in the Pearl District. So you can see it's right next to Blick, uh, the art. Right, the art and supply store. Yeah, so it's about uh, 11th and Glisten, I want to say, or some, uh -huh. somewhere right, right around there. Yep. Let's go, let's go to the next one. So this is um, so this this one actually relates to my um, my great grandmother. This is a piece that I made um, in a, in collaboration with a uh, a wood carver who was actually one of my first mentors, uh, David Svensson, who spent many many years up in Alaska working with uh, Clinkett carvers and um, learning the tradition of the wood carving uh, with you know adzes and hook knives and what have you. Um, so this is a story of my great grandmother who had a pet grizzly bear as a child. And so you can see the top figures got the grizzly bear cub um, and, you know, kind of in a, uh, a short version of the story it was like she had this little cub that, you know, some of the family was out hunting uh, in the Sitka, right in the village of Sitka. They shot a bear. They found these little cubs rooting around. So they brought one back or they brought these cubs back to the village and my great grandmother raised it as a pet. And um, as we all know, you know, uh, bears have a, um, uh, a sweet tooth. And at that time there was a, a lot of Russians in Sitka um, and a woman that made saltwater taffy apparently. Um, so my great grandmother would go out to uh, pick berries so she could sell them so she could get Russian, Russian money to buy taffy for her her uh, pet, and so this is kind of you know an extension of tradition. You know, typically a, a totem pole tells a story. It um, you know it's it's a visual language, and so it more or less requires um, uh, a narration about you know what it symbolizes. And so this particular one has uh, you know, the eagle crest or the eagle moiety, the, the killer whale crest on the blanket design, which you can't see too clearly um, and, uh, and so forth. And this is actually cast glass. So this is um, a lost wax casting, if you're familiar with that, that kind of process. So it involves taking a piece of sculpture and then making a series of molds. And then it, eventually you have a, a wax positive, you create a plaster around the positive, you melt the wax out and then you load it with glass and then you fire it and the glass basically melts into the negative space and then 
um, once you remove the plaster, then you have this sculpture more or less. But it's actually takes it, it takes more or less a year to fabricate this because you know with the, the mold making process, sometimes the plas sometimes the, the plaster breaks very slightly and then glass will seep through. And then you have to spend a lot of time grinding the the detail back into the into the form. So it's too absolutely beautiful. Plastic. Let's take a look at the next one. Mm -hmm. So this is the um, the exhibition Raven in the Box of Daylight. This was um, kind of a culmination of uh, working with another Clinkett elder named Walter Porter, who passed away um, unfortunately in about 2013 or so. Um, and uh, so he, so Walter worked with me. Um, you know, he was really fascinated with my uh, the work that I was doing, and in particular the Raven uh, pieces that I'd made with the ball, you know, kind of tucked into the, the mouth of the Raven. And so he asked me about it, and he started to share with me his information about it. So he considered himself a mythologist. He considered himself, uh, um, you know, a storyteller. And he was a very amazing person, very captivating, you know, in his way of, of sharing these stories uh, with people. He um, had basically kind of, I, he, I call him the clinkage Joseph Cornell. He was, he was kind of <laughs> drawing parallels from different, mo, you know, mythologies and theologies and, and basically, um, uh, you know, identifying the symbolism behind it. And so, so um, unfortunately he passed away before we had the time to, um, you know, complete, you know, the exhibition. So I worked with uh, um, another curator who was also Clinkett uh, and Zuni Pueblo, uh, but she is one of the, she's a, um, a tenured professor at the University of Washington today. Her name is Miranda. Lardy Lewis, and she, um, um, so she helped me with um, kind of contextualizing the whole show and analyzing different stories of Raven. So there's several different versions of the Raven in the Box of Daylight. And so um, I created this um, kind of an immersive experience of uh, walking through the thread of the story. And it's- This is amazing. And, and this is a traveling exhibit. That's correct. Yeah, it's it's um, it's going to open up at the Smithsonian at the ah. National Museum of the American Indian in uh, January 2021, and then beyond that, it'll go to the uh, Chrysler Museum in Norfolk. In Norfolk. Yeah. No, you said January 2021. Do you mean it has okay. opened? It yeah. has opened. Do you mean 2022? Yeah, next next January. 2022. Yeah. That's going to be an absolute. You know something on everybody's itinerary because that's going to be amazing. I, I wanted to read you something and ask you to uh, reflect on this. You, you wrote, Preston, that the um, visual language of Indigenous people um, is very unique and, and powerful, and it has connections to ancient codes and symbols of the land. And I'm wondering, as a modern artist, in a very individualistic society, working within a tradition that's a very uh, communitarian cultural tradition. Mm -hmm. How do you find that as an artist in working with these symbols and codes which have their own embedded meaning and then you bring into it your individual vision as an individual artist of the 21st century? Well, I think I do that with um, the material first off. Um, you know, glass is not traditional. Uh, but I do, I do like to point out you know, that the glass has a defining historic connection to native culture, which came through trade deeds. You know, so if you, you know, fast forward, it's now we're sort of taking control of the making of the glass and shaping of the, of the, you know, this, this artwork. And um, so, yeah, there's a, that's, it's pretty, that's a broad question in terms of intellectual property. 
which is a huge issue uh, or, or topic, you know, within the uh, Alaska Native community because all of these symbols basically uh, connect back to family lineages. Some of them are more in the public domain, uh, and some of them are very, uh, very much like uh, property, considered property. Um, songs, dances, uh, stories, um, specific designs that are, you know, historically known um, and have been preserved. <clears throat> so essentially, uh, what I learned through Walter Porter was that you can share these symbols in, you know, for the most part, you know, if you're knowledgeable and you understand you know, the context in which they come down uh, to us. Um, and, you know, uh, uh, and the fact is that, that these stories are um, really have a universal uh, meaning to them. You know, you think about Raven in the Box of Daylight, you know, Raven is um, going to bring, you know, us out of the darkness and into the light, you know. So, you know, it's like Walter loved to quote theology because he said, you know, I just want to, I just want to, you know, say that, uh, you know, uh, I didn't, I don't want to think that people can hog Jesus all to themselves. So he would say, you know, you know, Jesus is the light. I am the light. So these, you know, these this kind of duality of um, dark and light. You know, within the context of the Raven story is also, um, you know, there's messages of forgiveness. There's messages of, uh, you know, this transformation. There's uh, immaculate conception. You know, the daughter becomes pregnant. She doesn't have a husband. So, but it's really Raven that's, you know, inside of her and transforming. Uh, she gives birth to him in a form of a human child. Um, there's, uh, you know, there's, there's um, uh, symbolism of water, there's symbolism, you know, that is all very universal. And when we look at it universally, uh, it's easy to be able to um, make the argument that this information should be shared. And so that's yeah. what I really learned from, from Walter. Well, wow, that's that's the parallels that's so striking between all these uh, spiritual traditions. Mm -hmm. Let's look at a few more images. Uh, um, Kelsey, are we able to have the next? Mm -hmm. Ah, yeah. This so this one. So um, this one I made um, a, a version of this for an exhibition that I had uh, past uh, spring. And it was kind of an homage to my father, who was a great outdoorsman, um, and uh, he, uh, you know, he worked for Boeing for most of his mm -hmm. life. But then he also was a fly fisherman and, um, you know, uh, a mountain climber from rock climbing, snow climbing, glacier climbing. Um, he lived here in the Northwest his whole life, and um, so this was. Um, kind of my way of creating a mythology around him. So, you know, he passed away in November of last year on election night, auspiciously enough. And he, uh, um, so he'd been, he'd been fighting lung cancer for the past year or so. Um, so we knew it was coming, but, um, and then, so what I did is I quickly uh, pivoted to um, turning, you know, turning all of the work that I was making um, into the story about him getting on the river because he loved to float the Stillaguamish River. And so I made this piece to kind of an, as an homage to him and um, his connection to nature. So uh, you can see the river and the, you know, kind of splitting between the, 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 two, the two figures there. You've got an a eagle kind of peering over and, you know, checking them out. Wow. What did your father think of you becoming an artist when you were 19? You know, he, um, um, he I, I think uh, in the end, he was quite, uh, you know, he was very impressed with what I had accomplished, you know, with all of this. And I think that, you know, he always, I mean, he lived uh, by Green Lake and he, he, uh, um, so he would always come out to the exhibitions and, 
and keep tabs on what I was doing musically or with art. And so, yeah, I was think so for me, it was, it was, a, it was an amazing way of, of processing the loss of him, you know, yeah. kind of, you know, he was on my mind constantly as I was trying to figure out how I could make objects that might relate to his life in some way, or kind of tell the story of how he, um, how he lived, you know, on the river and in the mountains. Yeah, that was his passion. You know, Boeing was just a, a means to an end for him. <laughs> there's, such, there's such a sense of movement in that piece. I, I, you can feel the spirit of your dad, I, I think. It's, it's kind of a little bit of a pictorial uh, yeah. style that I've been developing. And it's kind of, so it's kind of interesting. Uh, I like playing with that, uh, you know, again, just after a while, you have to kind of try new things and reinvent yourself. So this was um, kind of a direction that I've been going. Yeah, you said something a little bit earlier before we go to the next image that um, many indigenous art traditions require a narration to fully understand what each of the uh, symbols means. Uh, we're so used to in contemporary, contemporary culture to bring our own interpretation to everything. Here's a, an artwork that is an homage to your dad. And yet each of us will, will feel something from that and it will reflect in different ways. How do you feel as an artist? Do you, do you want people to have the sort of written narrative that explains it? Do you want people to bring their own interpretation or is it a, a melding of those two approaches? Well, you know, this, uh, this, what I've been trying to do is give um, the pieces kind of, you know, poetic titles, uh, Morning Fog on the River. Mm -hmm. It's just how this piece turned out because the, uh, the top uh, section of the glass, you know, is experimenting with how to make the glass fade from one color to another, mm -hmm. which is a technique I just haven't uh, exploited too much. And, you know, with the surface uh, color, um, it allowed me to, uh, you know, to create this, this, this contrast. And so when it came out very murky and almost, you know, kind of, you know, slightly opaque, um, I, I decided, uh, you know, that, you know, that's how I try to create a distinction. So I, I try to make things a little different or change up my way of thinking around it. Your, your color is beautiful. Let's, let's have the next slide, Kelsey. Yeah, so, um, so this is a brand new piece. This was similar, you know, I made another similar piece. So I'm kind of in this theme. Sometimes I'll, I'll work, you know, in, in groups of two or three. Um, and, you know, so you can see the, the arc of this, um, uh, you know, post. It almost looks like a fishing pole, right? So, <laughs> so uh, and then also I've been um, very, I consider myself very influenced by uh, modern modernist art movement um, and it's something that I like to play with in terms of um, you know kind of turning the tables on the modernists you know whereas um, modernism led to primitivism primitivism was basically the modernists reflecting on older you know I, I like to call them non-technological cultures and there's a great exhibition that was at the Museum of Modern Art you know, called primitivism, and they kind of analyzed and broke down the, the 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 connections that the modernists, such as Picasso, Henry Moore, and Gauguin, and all these artists were um, were looking at um, um, Native American art, Oceanic art, African art. You know, it's very well known that that uh, Picasso was inspired by African art sculpture, um, and sometimes in the paintings. And so, um, you know, what I read, you know, what I got a hold of that that uh, that catalog of called primitivism, it was fascinating because you know it, it gave me um, a lot of insight to um, artist thought process and 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 the fact that they felt um, uh, these modernists it was written in this catalog saying that they felt that their work was disempowered you know, uh, because it was, you know, due to being created for the commercial market, whereas African art, Native American art had this mm -hmm. sense of, of ceremony or uh, it, it, it was, you were, you were able to use it to some degree. Um, 
it was also kind of made to uh, explain man's connections to the cosmos. And so that was um, um, something I, you know, I really got a lot out of, you know, and, and so I started to look at modernist art, art and this, of course, this is inspired by Calder, you know, the mobile or, or the stabilia that they, you know, the table mounted uh, mobiles that he, he made. And so I kind of enjoy, you know, uh, letting those influences kind of uh, come through my artwork. And that's, really, that's, that's, yeah, that's so interesting to hear. You know, one of the things that inspire, I think everybody's inspired by when they, when they learn about your career and the work you've done is how you've reached out to other First Nations, Indigenous artists uh, in North America, of course, uh, your, your heritage, but also globally. Um, talk a little bit about your work with other Indigenous artists. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, um, I started collaborating with artists early on. Um, I mean, actually, glass blowing is really a collaborative process into itself. And so for me, it was natural to want to bring people into that, you know, uh, uh, process and, and experiment. So I started working with um, Tammy Garcia, who's a Santa Clara Pueblo potter. Um, you know, the vessel forms, you know, these pottery forms that uh, she was doing really harken back to my love of, you know, classical forms, you know, vessel forms. And I knew that her work was going to uh, look spectacular in, you know, in, in the glass form, you know, have the translucency and all of that. So we made a series of pieces. We probably made, um, I want to say we made over a hundred pieces together. Um, we uh, we um, would make these pot forms, and then she would design them, and I um, I uh, would cut them out and sandblast them, you know, carve the designs into them, send them back to her, um, and you know, you know, and then early on, the Native American art collector was a little leery of of this glass material they were you know well it's not tradition and you know uh you know what's the value of this and so but i knew that tammy's work was so sought after that it was gonna um you know turn a few heads and it really effectively helped cross over the material of glass into the native american collector um and so consequently or subsequently i've, I've gone um, I've been to uh, part of these uh, indigenous artist gatherings, you know, both in Hawaii and uh, New Zealand. So I've worked with Hawaiian artists. I've worked with uh, Maori artists from New Zealand. I've been on a cultural art exchange where I went to Australia and interacted with some Aboriginal people. Um, and so, you know, each time when I work, you know, with these artists, there's always, um, uh, again, like the symbolism uh, getting back to that, you know, there sometimes there's there is um, um, something that you just don't share uh, within the commercial market. So, um, so I'm learning all the time from by working with other people. Like, how do they how do they interpret their their cultural art for today's you know um, world? And you know, the fact is that. Um, a lot of you know in in the old days the work that was made would 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 have been for the community right mm -hmm. a lot of the work that i make today is uh for the commercial market mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so i'm you know i'm i'm kind of winning people over uh with the artwork but i'm also hopefully showing them something new and something different and that you know something that they can learn from or appreciate on a different level mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, so that's a that's a something that I, I think about a lot. You know, a lot of the work that um, I I make, you know, it goes into other people's homes that uh, have no connection to the culture whatsoever. Uh, but you know, I still contend, like if there were no good practicing working artists, there would be no good art. So um, the <laughs> fact that I've I've kind of worked out my process to um, synthesize the designs for um, for my for my through my medium um, when the time came 
uh, you know, when I was called upon by my community to make something uh, significant, I had had, you know, 20 years of experience and I was able to, uh, I was able to, uh, to make something very timely and, or, or, or you know, uh, uh, that, that looks like it is part of the cultural art, but also will last and, mm -hmm. and look strong. Yeah, and I mean, the, your ability to bring together the contemporary and, and the enduring and traditional, and as you say, I mean, it has a tradition in Western art with people like Picasso and Matisse, and so different than the strictly commercial artists like the, the Andy Warhol tradition, where it really is about the commodification, celebrating that through art. It's, it's such an interesting point you're making. Your, your work is, um, all glass work is, is very tactile. Uh, it's very much about form and color and touch even, because when you look at it, you feel like you're touching it. Um, how do you, what's your thought about color or, or how does color um, and, and texture play a, a role in your art? Is it something you- Well, yeah, I mean, I, 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 um, I tend to work uh, with color like, like a duotone more or less, you know, like a positive negative. Um, you know, traditionally there would have been a third color introduced. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in the beginning, I, I put a lot of constraints on myself where I, I wanted to work with like red, red and black, and mm -hmm. you know, or blue and black, or or whatever, or earth tone colors to mimic the the uh, the the color of wood, you know, or cedar or alder or whatever. Um, and uh, and then over time, I was like, you know. I have all access to all these colors, you know, so I just, I just started to really kind of go, you know, a little bit crazy with it. And, and then I was able to um, come up with new, you know, new kinds of effects, you know, of working with color. Um, the texture is also something, you know, it's like a lot of the basket forms that I work with and some of the pieces that you have in your collection, uh, the baskets, you know, so I, I've created like a, a weaving pattern. So it, it just involves putting a vinyl tape uh, down very methodically. So it looks like it's woven. You know, you sandblast the texture into it and you remove a layer and you sandblast again, and you remove more layers. And, and then it kind of looks like it's, you know, it's kind of like, you know, uh, cro like cross, cross hatching. We're gonna, we're gonna look at that one. Kelsey, okay. let's, let's have the, uh, the next slide. We have a couple of questions too, Preston, that I want to get to from, um, this is such an incredibly beautiful piece. And I, I wonder about how it, it seems to be luminous internally as well as externally. Yeah, yeah. Would, would you be willing to outline the process of how this piece, Safe Journey, came into being? What, you know, you've talked about some of the techniques, some of the conceptual ideas. Yeah. What, so, what's the journey of Safe Journey? So this this was um, uh, working together with an art um, uh, an artist or fabricator out of um, Portland, and so I basically brought you know my question to him or you know can you know he help me make this chest form? So these are typically made out of um, uh, wood. You know they're sort of uh, curved and bent. You know steamed into the rectangular, you know, or a rectangular shape and then carved or painted. Um, in this case, I uh, carved uh, a design into the, into, the for, into the form. And in this particular one, I, I, uh, those two lights that you see, they're, ac they're actually kind of like toys that uh, project kind of a constellation. Um, and in some cases, these pieces are um, uh, bur <laughs> burial boxes or storage boxes. And so, um, so I put these lights in there and I wanted to create like a galaxy inside of it. Um, wow. And uh, so it, it kind of created two hotspots, you know, uh, and, but if, you, if you're looking at the piece, then you see like this subtle kind of spinning of, you know, stars and um, color and light and stuff. So um, what it came to symbolize for me in the end was, you know, um, kind of the idea of a burial box, but, you know, a safe journey for my father. And, it, you know, it's like uh, my father and his father, my grandfather, 
you know, he was very close to. So the two of them kind of there uh, as lights. Wow, that is, that is really, really remarkable and beautiful. You've talked about the influence of your father and your grandfather and your great grandfather and grandmother we've heard about. Who is a young artist right now that none of us maybe have heard of that you're keeping your eye on that we should be aware of? Oh, you know, um, gosh, there's uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of women out there. Uh, Ryan Federson is doing really great work. Um, uh, she and, and as and there there is a, a bit of a movement, you know, um, of younger contemporary Native artists that are that are out there. Um, there's a fellow that I work with collaboratively with my music named Nahan. He's a, he's a tattoo artist. He's doing like traditional um, kind of reviving the tattoo tradition, um, uh, you know, of, of Tlingit style. Um, and we're, um, you know, we're, we're playing music together. Um, and uh, let's see who, gosh. <laughs> but no, that's, a, that's kind of a, drawing a blank. But there's no, a no, no. That was a, yeah. that was an unfair question. But it, it sound, you know, it, it, it's so interesting to hear you talk about the young people you are working, you are working with, um, because you know, Preston, you're, you know, you're probably forever young, but you're, you know, you're becoming this, you know, you're becoming a legend in your own right, right? So people are looking to you as being a mentor, and I know that mentorship is important to you. Mm -hmm. Can we have the next slide, um, Kelsey? because I think this is very special to us. There you go. Preston, we are so honored and you know, truly humbled by the fact that you very, very generously, and we were just so blown away, as you know, when you donated three, um, uh, three blanket baskets um, to Mohai for our permanent collection, and they are in display right now. Can you tell me a little bit about these? Well, yeah, I was happy to uh, to make the gift to Mohai. I think I think it's an incredible institution. I was I was I was uh, kind of dismayed when it moved from the uh, the the previous location, but I was really overjoyed to see that the current location is just an amazing space. I mean, you guys are so I'm I'm glad that you guys are there because uh, to make use of that that beautiful building. Um, and uh, so these were, this is a collection that I, that I had. Um, I thought that they looked very good together, you know, because of the, the opal glass. Um, these are all based on, on um, you know, traditional clinket baskets. They are things that I've basically studied through looking at uh, basket, basketry books. Um, and it's also to say that a lot of these designs were created, um, you know, this sort of Greek key patterns and things like that um, are, are um, you know, some of the older basket designs, I've looked at them and studied them and, and figured out, you know, all of the information that was assigned to them. Uh, the, the, the red one that is on my right, I think it's on your right too, um, that's kind of considered a, a butterfly pattern, uh, but at the at the point of contact, you know, in the age of um, you know um, contact, a lot of baskets were made for uh, for uh, the tourist trade essentially, yeah. um, and so in some cases they didn't have a, any particular symbolism or meaning behind them but they were just kind of the geometry but i have a lot i have a lot of fun you know uh playing with those geometric patterns and how they break down mathematically and how you can wrap them around you know the circumference of the piece and so it's become kind of um a uh i don't know sort of an object that i offer that is um you know, it's a little more affordable <laughs> than some of the more large pieces, the more exclusive pieces. And so I get a lot of joy out of making these and like to have them around. And when I get, you know, a whole pile of them, I, I can see how they relate to each other mm -hmm. and kind of have a little bit of a dialogue. And so that's why these pieces ended up together and in your collection. 
Oh, they're, they're just fantastic. And they are actually on view right now. We have a couple of qu uh, questions. I just want to get to really quickly. Um, mm -hmm. One very specific question is how tall is letting the wind carry? What's the dimension height wise? Uh, how tall is uh, letting the wind carry? Oh, it's it's about 23, 24 inches is tall um, by, I want to say, uh, yeah, probably like 24 inches uh, wide. Um, you know, the arc of those pieces and how big kind of extend into the air. Yeah. And then overall, it's probably about 12 inches in diameter. You know, with the, the, the main um, sculptural piece, uh, blown glass form is, is um, yeah, probably about 18 inches by five inches wide. And, and people are asking, Preston, where can they see your work in Seattle? I, I know you have a gallery, you have a studio, you're represented in museums. Yeah. Where, where are some places people can go? Well, uh, Traver Gallery is my main gallery. Um, they're located on Union Street, right across from the Seattle Art Museum. On the second floor above where Cafe Ladro is we'll probably come back. We hope. <laughs> um, anyways, uh, um, I also have some representation of Stonington Gallery as well as uh, Steinbrook Gallery in uh, in the market. They're both Native Art Galleries, and so I um, have a little bit of work. You know, kind of a smaller selection of work in both of those uh, galleries as well. Yeah, and then somebody's asked. Um, is there any intersection between your art and your music? Uh, there is. The music that I do is actually also connected to the cultural um, um, kind of, it, it's kind of like the musical version of my art, um, uh, my other mode of uh, artistic expression. And so I work collaboratively with other Native uh, people. Um, we um, are about six natives. There's uh, four Clinket, one Haida uh, woman, um, and a Blackfoot, uh, our guitar player is Blackfoot. Um, and then we work collaboratively with jazz musicians. And wow. we, we, have, we, are, we have, our, our uh, band is called Kuik, which means um, potlatch in the Clinket language. Wow. How do you spell that, Preston? Yeah. Why don't I type how, how do you spell that? Or type in. I'm gonna type in the website. Okay, tell, yeah, type it into the, the chat or whatever. Um, wow, because I think people want it, there it is. Yeah. Uh, people will want to come hear you. Yeah, it's, it's um, you know, it is, for me, it's kind of uh, the best of both worlds. You know, I, 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 uh, <clears throat> I worked collaboratively with, um, with, that, with all of the members, um, but I had the good fortune of working with um, uh, this, rock musician named Bernie Warrell, who is the co-founder of Parliament Funkadelic. And he was uh, wow. an amazing, amazing keyboard player, very funk oriented, but classical. I mean, he played all styles of music. And uh, so I met him. Um, I met uh, Bernie when I turned 50 a couple of years ago. <laughs> and uh, paid into a Kickstarter where he came and he, he played um, uh, for my birthday level that I paid into. And then we got to know each other and he uh, expressed interest in collaborating with me. And then we, uh, we uh, make vinyl LPs with a digital download and it's also available through um, uh, Bandcamp and iTunes and all of that stuff. But wow. um, or you can go directly to the website and I can send um, um, vinyl LPs. And with that vinyl LP, you get the artwork, which is kind of cool, but then you get a digital download. So um, you can import it into your computer and stuff like that. Oh, so. That is so cool. And that website's really easy to find. And I think, is it, is it PrestonSingletary.com or what is it, Preston? Oh, the, it's uh, K-H-U-E-E-S. Oh, it's that website. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's the music website. Okay, that's the music website. Yeah. What's your website? Your your art Pre website? PrestonSingletary.com. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So that's uh, you know we have a pretty active uh, blog and mm -hmm. stuff 
you know keep people up to date uh, on on everything. Um, but you know, really, it's Facebook and Instagram. You know, we're, okay. we're always posting on there. For people who would like to keep in touch, um, you can go to Preston Singletary Glass on Facebook, and then we're always um, updating, you know, um, events and shows and what That's have cool. you. People are checking in right now. Um, okay. Lori has a really specific question. This will be our, our getting close to our last question. Um, have you ever thought about getting inspiration from the traditional use of obsidian or other natural glass types? Um, you know, I, I, I had a, there was an artist um, that was at Pilchuck um, when I was there a couple weeks ago, who came from um, Northern California, which was a volcanic region. They had a lot of obsidian in, the, in their territory. And um, she was really interested in what she could do with it. And I know that that material is very, very brittle. And so um, it might have uh, similar kind of working properties, um, but I understand that it's so brittle that when you go to heat it up, it just kind of, it kind of breaks apart um, and almost kind of, um, yeah, just in, in shards really. So um, I think you might be able to reform it. I, I just haven't had any um, access to it. Uh, to see what you could do with it, but I know that it's, uh, you know, it's a little, uh, it's a, it's a little less stable than the glass that we work with because uh, we work with glass that has a lot of soda lime in it, which makes it very viscous, and we can shape and manipulate it. Mm -hmm. And then some of the casting uh, that we do, where we um, kiln form the glass into molds or whatever. Um, and that's often done with like a lead crystal. So the lead crystal also makes it very, very soft, easy to heat up and, and cool um, in a controlled way. Yeah, wow, that's, that's interesting. I can't let you go without asking you to talk a little bit about the incredible artwork that you're sitting in front of, because I'm sure somebody is wondering what that is the most beautiful thing. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's here in our region, isn't it? Yeah, this is a piece that was um, in my grand hall here. <laughs> Just, you know, in my living room. So, uh, you can tell it's a virtual picture. This was an exhibition that I made, uh, or a piece that was for an acquisition slash exhibition at the Museum of Glass. And this is uh, multi panes of glass or panels of glass that have been handmade. And um, they are made with a layer of black um, colored glass on one surface. So we call it flash glass. That's what we call it in um, the glass making process. And so the, the mural is basically drawn across these multiple panels and then um, and then the stencil is applied and I'll cut out the, the stencil accordingly with a, an exacto blade exposing the areas that are going to be carved. And basically um, most everything that I do is sandblasted. So you're basically sweeping a nozzle of pressurized um, uh, aluminum oxide and it, it's a really good cutting agent uh, against the glass. And so the stencil material holds the line. So the black line, At one point all these panels were black. And so I carved through the layer of black to expose the color underneath. Then the two pieces on the left and right are referred to as house posts and those are um, more or less a, a lost wax casting. So we've got two of them. The, the circles that you see, you can't tell, can't see them very close, but they're, uh, they're um, different design work. Um, and uh, one's an eagle and one's a killer whale. Mm. This very ancient iconography, these very contemporary methods and methodologies, you bring it all together and it's really amazing. And I just can't thank you enough, Preston, for joining us tonight but really beyond that for what you've done for our community uh, in yeah. so many ways. And, and we're, we're deeply honored to have you. Mary Ellie, do you need to come back to wish us a good night or should I, should I close this out? Go ahead and close this out, Leonard. All right, I'll do it. That's the voice of Mary Ellie. Preston, you're remarkable. And people wanna know what is your next big
project. I, I let me just say one thing: climate change arena. I think that you're working on that. Are you not? That's true. There's a public art piece that will be um, uh, installed for the uh, arena. That's going to be happening in the fall, uh, wow. October, November, I believe. Um, so yeah, the public art thing is kind of um, yeah a little bit. You know, other projects on the horizon. Um, you know, if anybody gets down to Santa Fe, I have a gallery down there, and there's a, there's an exhibition in the third week of of August at Blue Rain Gallery. So that's the next exhibition that's coming up, and you can find them, you know, BlueRainGallery.com, um, and that's where I'll uh, I have a lot of work that's going down there, probably about fifteen to. Uh, uh, Maybe, well, actually, maybe as maybe as many as twenty pieces that wow. are going to be um, at that show. New pieces. Wow, that's exciting too. So some really important things to look forward to. Thank you, Preston. Thank you for your your donation to Mohai for being with us tonight. Now, you also want to thank all of our members who have joined us tonight. We have a great new exhibit opening up in late July, the thirty first. The inventions of Leonardo da Vinci. He was a great artist. We know that he was also an amazing inventive. Uh, um, person whose genius is reflecting a lot of the things that we take for granted today began as prototypes in the brain of Leonardo da Vinci. So we'll be sharing that amazing story with our community starting on July 31st. And it's all possible really because of you, your members and your supporters and your dear friends. So thank you to Preston, to all of you for joining us. Um, I hope you have a wonderful week. The museum is open and we look forward to seeing you there very soon. So again, thank you, Preston. Thank you, Mary Ellie and Kelsey for your support and thank you everyone. Good night. All right, good night.